In 1919, he hit 29 home runs and was sold to the New York Yankees. A three-run home run for Bucky Dent. The Yankees now lead it by a score of 3-2. to Bill Lee is now going over to a couple of the Yankees, and there they go again. Tech and A-Rod going at it. Roberts is going. Masada's throw. Roberts safe. And what can I say? Just dip my hat and, and call the Yankees my daddy. Welcome to Fanbase, a deep dive into the greatest rivalry in sports. Really happy in studio uh, to have Bobby Meacham, uh, obviously former pro ball player, and he's been in pro baseball. How long, Bobby? How long has it been? It's the total number of years without dating you too much? Should I say uh, 43 <laughs> years. That's just... <laughs> I, I love your perspective. Now he's the double-A manager for the Hartford Yard Goats, who's the affiliate for the Colorado Rockies. Brian Shackman, uh, John Senecal here, along with Mr. Meacham. And I'm, I'm pretty fascinated because you can talk about a couple generations of athletes, right? And I, I'm just curious how the athlete is, – is the athlete – the mental side, because I have three teenagers, mm-hmm. and they, they are not like I was. And I love <laughs> my kids, but they are different. And I think it's not all positive. I think whether it's technology or what, I don't know. But is, is, are the problems the same? Are the challenges the same? Are the kids the same? I, you know, I, I always start every conversation that answers that question with, it's our fault. You know, it's like the, right. the, the people who raise our kids, uh, you know, we kind of do it the, the way uh, – we're supposed to the way society tells us to it. Sometimes it's not right, but I think the players are the same. I think they're the same as when I was there. It's just a matter of who's around them, who the coaching is, uh, what kind of philosophies we come up with for them, what kind of systems and processes we put in place for them. And then they react to that. So uh, once again, I, I really truly believe the players are basically the same. And uh, it's just a matters. The matter, uh, what matters is how we treat them and how we, how we coach them. How important for like for you and just looking at your past, like you started off in the minors, you struggled a little bit, and then you turned the corner maybe when you switched to the Yankees organization. And now you see kids with the high bonuses, they're getting to the majors sooner. Mm-hmm. Uh, how important are the minors still in the in the group? Because we know baseball is about failure, right? I right. mean, you've got to fail before you can succeed almost everybody. I mean, is it still super valuable in your opinion? Yeah, it can be. You know, I, I've looked at it two different ways. I was, I was a high pick, so I was – I was uh, I wasn't as good as I was supposed to be, as I always tell my son. But I was a high pick, and I see these guys that are, you know, we kind of treat them like I said, we treat them differently because, oh man, they're they signed for a lot of money, or they were a high pick, and they're always the favorite on one team. So, and then we treat them differently, so then they don't learn as much. I think back when I played, when I the the reason I had so much success, I believe, is quickly is because I got traded to the Yankees. So I drafted by the Cardinals, and then the Yankees got me. They didn't care that I was the number one pick. They didn't know I was. They didn't care <laughs> at all. So I just got a lot of information um, from a lot of coaches. Billy Martin uh, taught me a ton. Don Zimmer taught me a ton. Yogi Berra taught me a ton. Um, then the players I was surrounded by, like Randolphs and the and Winfields, I was I was able to learn because they didn't care about anything but getting me better. So we so we as a team could get better. John, yeah, you talk about um, learning from these coaches and stuff, but um, I'm interested further back in mm-hmm. your development. Um, when did it kick in for you to become a switch hitter? Because we don't see that in yeah. be- baseball at all, really across the board in the history of baseball, and especially nowadays. When did it kick in for you? Yeah, my wife's saying is it's the worst thing you ever did in baseball. <laughs> Why? Why did she say that? Well, you know, I, st- I was a, you know, I was all American at San Diego State. I was the first round pick hitting just right handed. Never hit left handed before. Uh, I got to my 1982 season. Um, the Cardinals, and that back then, liked to take guys who were fast and make them switch hitters. So um, it was always a maybe if I was going to hit at the pro level when I was a prospect in, in college ball. So they right away made me a switch hitter, and I had success right away. I went to A ball, hit, hit 260 uh, my very first year in high A ball, and but then the problem was after that I got traded to the Yankees, and I. I only spent one half a season in the minor leagues before I got called up for the first time. So I literally have one and a half seasons of switch hitting. So the, that minor league development didn't really happen um, as far as on the defense, on the offensive side. Um, and I basically had to learn in the, at the big league level. Wait, so you stayed a switch hitter in the bigs? Yeah, I, and, I did. First of all, that's insane. I never, at first, I didn't know that. I thought maybe you grew up switch hitting, but mm-hmm. you became a late bloomer switch. That's not, I've never heard of that in my whole life. Yeah, it, it was 
kind of, you know, it happened back then. It was pretty common for guys who could run, especially in that Cardinals organization. Were you a, what's your natural, right? right? And so you became a slap hitter left-handed? or I was always a slap hitter, even right-handed <laughs> <laughs> in college. You know, I, even to the end of my – I remember uh, I was at San Diego State, right, and I went back for an induction of they – whatever, you know, they get rid of – they honor you with a number of retirement. Yeah, Hall of Famer. And yeah. Tony Gwynn, I played with Tony – uh, Tony Gwynn for three years there, and Tony was like at the very end. He's taking me to the airport, and uh, you know we're old and older, and kind of like reminiscing. He goes, "Hey, let me ask you a question, and don't get mad." I go, "What's up?" He's like, "Why did you switch hit?" You know, it was like because I you could you could hit, and I was like, "Yeah, it wasn't the point." You know, it was it was the Cardinals' kind of way of doing things, and I basically had to learn at the big league level. Huh? That's crazy. I, I can't. I... That's amazing. It really is. I was expecting you to be like, oh, yeah, I was 13. I was in Little League. No. I just I was bored one day. And I but you wanted to it. talk about Gwen. Yeah, so you yeah. mentioned Tony Gwen, And, um, you know, if you read about your relationship with Tony Gwen, it says that you basically encouraged him to play baseball. Like, what? What's the us, real get, story? Yeah, what's here's, the real story? Yeah, here's the real deal, guys. I, I was in high school. Tony was a year ahead of me. And he went to high school in Long Beach. I went to high school, uh, probably well-known school now, Modern Day High School in Santa Ana. So we played against each other in summer league. Uh, he was a year ahead of me. I forgot all about Tony. I really I remembered him because he played on, on the, against him. And then when we went to the state tournament at the end, uh, we, uh, we picked him up to play for us on our team. So I go to pick up. So I, yeah, yeah. Exactly. By the way, you have the same SoCal diction, by the way, that both of you. Oh, do we? Yeah, totally. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, no. So then we, you know, I, my, a friend of mine who was a year ahead of me at, at Modern Day, he went to San Diego State named Nick Harsh. So Nick goes to San Diego State and he says, hey, man, you remember this guy? Because I was getting recruited to go to San Diego State I, my senior year in high school. He goes, remember that guy that played for us in summer, Tony, that guy Tony? I go, yeah. He goes, well, he's here. I said, wow, man, we, I mean, that's awesome. When, we, if, when I get there, if I go there, we're going to have a great team, I, I bet. And he goes, no, no, he's not even playing baseball. He's playing basketball. He's on a basketball scholarship. So we're all scheming and planning. When, when I come to San Diego State, we got to talk him into playing baseball. So he had already – got, I got to San Diego State my freshman year. Just so happens the basketball – he was a sophomore. He was a starting point guard, doing great in basketball. Um, we tried to talk him into playing base, baseball, but he said, I can't because I'm on a basketball scholarship. My coach won't let me. So fast forward to they had a terrible season again, and the coach got fired. And in the interim, Tony just came, you know, we brought him to our baseball coach, Jim Deeds, and said, hey, this guy's got to play for us. Jim let him play. And, um, and then when he got, got back to basketball, um, you know, he talked to his new basketball coach and said, I'm doing both. And that's how Tony so started you're playing. talking about – one of the best hitters in professional baseball, Hall of Famer, basically doesn't start playing like real, real, real baseball competitively until he's almost a junior in college. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Because in sophomore year in college, he got a bit part right after fastball season was over, and then, then finally, you know, all of us for I knew, but coach was convinced he should play every day once he once he gets done with basketball season. So he finished basketball season the next two years, then come out for baseball. Did you know? Like, was the coach like right? Was it right away with him? You just once you saw him at the plate, you knew. Oh man, I, I remember you know him like I said from high school, yeah. and it was like one of those things where it's like, man, this definitely translates to college too. Because right away, it was it was almost embarrassing. You know, we he'd come out after we played ten games, and and he would already have more like RBIs than me. You know, and I'd be like, in our first double header or something. I'm like, this is crazy. Uh, Tony, you gotta never... take some credit for a Hall of Fame career. <laughs> it just wasn't yours. Well, well I, I think the basketball team should take credit for being terrible. And yeah, that's, that's, how, that's how he got. Imagine to how if they had a good basketball team, how history would have been changed. Yeah, it would have been totally, totally different. Listen, we're we're so glad to have Bobby Meacham in the Double A manager for the Hartford Yard Ghosts, the Colorado Rockies affiliate here on Fan Base, a deep dive into the greatest rivalry in sports. John Senecal, myself, Brian Shackman here. I, we we should probably go straight ahead to the Yankees since you know the premise of this podcast. And you know, for, you know, you you talked about was it the '85 season when they won '95? Yeah, well, you come to the, the Yankees playoffs? in what '83? I came, yeah, I got called up in '83, and '90 and '85 is when we won actually '97 games and did not make the playoffs. That's and you could have made it. I mean, now you'd be the the first wild card, <laughs> you know, and you'd be you could easily win the World Series. I mean, this, I mean, there's so many great teams littered in the '70s and '80s that never made the play, playoffs. But I, I want to start broad brush. I'm just curious, like. That that was um, not a championship era for the Yankees, right? And so, how what was it like to be a New York Yankee? Yeah, for me, you know, well, it's all I knew it as a big leaguer. You know, it's the only team I ever played for in the big leagues, and so um, at, in that era, all we cared about was, you know, we got to keep continue, we got to continue to win. They won in '81, I guess they go once the World Series. And when I came up in '83, it was just about winning. And George Steinbrenner—that's that's all that mattered to him. So 
uh, I was in the midst of just basically trying to, you know, be a good big leaguer for the first time and also uh, not be the the weak link that pulled us down. And and, um, and be honest with you, I, I feel like if, if, and I really believe this, if I truly would have been the, the player I was supposed to be, um, we would have made playoffs and we would have won championships in that era because we won a ton of games. We just needed a little bit more, a little bit, a little bit bigger push to get to the playoffs and, and make, make it to the, to the world series. The thing that like, blew me away when I went back and looked at that roster and, and the lineup is you know, I remember watching, that's like in my heyday, I'm like, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. And like those, you, you guys are my team, you know, and I first, like, I'm thinking Bobby Meacham, I think of your 1985 tops card, like, you know, I, right away, you know, and I know the name, I know, but I'm looking at the roster and I'm thinking, you know, uh, Mattingly, Winfield and you and Weiniger and all, like, I don't think Weiniger might have been there yet, but um, I look at the no, strikeouts, I look at the strikeouts, right? And I look at the strikeouts nowadays for a guy like if Dave Winfield was playing nowadays and he, you know, you think, oh, he's striking out 150 times or 160 times, but he's not. He's no. striking out like 40 times in a season. Like, what, what was the difference? Is there a difference between nowadays and back then? Yeah, I think the, I think the biggest difference, Sean, is that, that now guys are allowed to. I go back to it's our fault. Um, we always have this narrative that, hey, big home run hitters are, you know, they're going to swing hard and swing for the fences. Of course they're going to strike out. Well, we weren't allowed. We, it was like a no-no to take strike three if it was a close pitch. It wasn't like we come back and look at the computer and see if the umpire was wrong. It was, the, hey, that, that pitch is too close to take. Guys, put the ball in play. And now it's almost allowed where guys are, it's like, well, of course they're going to strike out. I, I love looking into that, like you just did, dug into Winfield's numbers. I love looking back, and I, I'll give you guys another number. We, if you take the four top home run hitters of all time, with a total of about 80 years of, worth of baseball, there's, they've only struck out of those 80 years, those top four guys. You got Ruth, Mays, Bonds, and, and who I'm missing, Aaron. One time, a hundred strikeout season. May struck out once. One hundred times. That's incredible. Times. I mean, and you don't have to strike out if you're a home run hitter. It's uh, it is stunning, and you know, I think you said he he led the team with like 107, right? Yeah. It was something like that. Yeah. I you know I I have some, I guess I'll go here right now because I I, I want to ask about Billy Martin, but I want to go deep. First of all, you an incredible career in professional baseball. I almost feel like there's a tinge of regret about how you, how you yourself performed. And I don't, I mean, you're, Absolutely. you're a great player though. And, and it just maybe you know, who it's so hard. I mean, I, I couldn't hit a curve. I was out by Babe Ruth, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I don't sell yourself short, but having said that, like, what is it? Is it the switch hitting part that you regret? Or is it just, you just didn't have more time to season yourself before things were real? Like, what do you point to? A little bit of both, both of those things. Um, you know, a little bit of more seasoning would have helped. A little bit more patience from the management. From man, you know, yeah. Billy Martin. I, I mean, he he played me all the time. I played 156 games, even though I hit two whatever 20 maybe that that year in in, 90, in 85. Um, but I played the last two months after cutting a cast off, and I was swinging left handed only for the last two months. Nobody remembers that part. And like I said, I wasn't very good. I just learned how to hit switch hit. I had a, I had a bad wrist. So it was some injuries. There were some things that uh, I, I wish I'd had more seasoning, maybe not in the minor leagues, but necessarily. But because I hit 250 my first season right. um, in the big leagues, but just a little more patience with what I could do. Right. And how so I if you were on a crap salad team, you could have breathed a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, you know, I talked to buddies of mine. They were on, you know, I don't know, like the Mariners or something like that. And, and they were they had time. You know, they had, okay, let's let this guy get better and better and we'll be better as a team. Well, the, you know, New York, when, with, without winning championships uh, in the 80s, well, since 81, getting to the World Series, you know, that wasn't good enough for George. And I'm all for it. Hey, I'm, I'm, I want to win. So, if, you know, like I said, I didn't do my part to, uh, to be good enough to stay around to, to make sure we did win. You mentioned um, the strikeouts and home run hitters, prolific home run hitters. And, and one of the main ones you mentioned was Hank Aaron. Right. Um, some will argue is the home run hitter of all time. Now, as we record now, today is the anniversary when he broke Babe Ruth's home run record. Now, if I'm doing my fuzzy math here, you're probably around 13, 14 years old at the time of him going Sounds up right. for that record. Was that something that shaped you as a person or as a player, um, being you know, the same descent and everything? Yeah, you know, I definitely, definitely. I remember um, the thing I remember the most about Hank Aaron is, is when he signed the largest contract in, in the history of baseball. I, I, I'm going to guess it was like 100000 a year, or maybe it was two hundred, or something like a round number like that. And I remember telling my mom, because growing up I was a big, big baseball fan, a big Dodger fan in Southern California, and I remember telling my mom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make more than that, Mom. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a big leaguer, and I'm going to be I'm going to be – I'm not going to be as good as Hank Aaron, but I remember seeing his salary and hearing about the records and that he was breaking and thinking, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do something special in baseball. And, 
you know, it was, you know like like you said, being a, being African American and in, in, uh, in this country and seeing that happen and all that surrounded it, it's pretty special. Yeah, I'm curious if you can just share with us whether it's George or Billy or Yogi. Just give us a story that hasn't like hit the papers or even like go on the Wayback Machine and give me some <laughs> some color that we wouldn't get anywhere else on those guys because it's like they're mythical figures for right. us, you right. know. Well, I can give you a couple. I mean, like Yogi. I remember my first thing with Yogi when my first spring training. He was the first base coach, I believe. We had so many coaches pass through, but I believe he was the first base coach for us. And um, I was thinking Yogi Berra. Wow, I heard all the stories about his yogiisms, right? And so my first day, we go out after. The first workout's done. He would go out, hey, go down the right field line with Yogi, and he's going to run you guys some sprints. So he goes, all right, guys. He goes, pair off into threes, and this, and I'm like, and run some. I'm like, and everybody just got you know into groups of threes, and I'm sitting there going, wait a minute, wait, that no, nah, I'm the only one that recognized it was Yogiism. <laughs> pair off into threes. So uh, that's one of them. Uh, Billy, Billy was my favorite to play for, and uh, man, Billy, I remember one time he came out of the clubhouse. I had just. Blew a, blew a game. I, made, I think I made an error. It cost us the game at the very end. And he just walked out and he looked at me. He has, just got his skivvies on. He's got a, I think he might have had a pipe in his mouth or something. You know, one of those mythical like yeah. things. He walks out and he looks at me and just shakes, nods his head. And I, and I'm like, what? And he goes, he goes, uh, what's wrong with you? And I said, ah, man, my bad for making, you know, costing us that game. He goes, he goes, you're bad. He goes, that's my bad for playing you. <laughs> <laughs> Was his, um, you know, his struggles, the dark side of him, was that evident to people? I, you know, I mean, I was 23 years old when I came out, or 22 when I got called up for the first time, and I just loved the information he gave me. Um, of course, I could tell he, you know, later I'm thinking, is he, is he drunk? Or, you know, or is he, you know, has he been drinking kind of thing? Or is he, is he, is he, but it, when, you know, the game started, he was smart. I knew we had an advantage because he was our manager. Um, when he talked to me about baseball, I, I listened and I mean, I stood up and listened and perked up and went, man, this guy's amazing with the information he's given me. So I never doubted. Um, I love playing for the man cause he, I taught, he taught me a ton and, uh, he let me, he let me do what I, what I do best and that's play baseball. You know, I wish we had more time, maybe mid season or something and some break you'll come back. Cause it's just, we have a whole lot more questions and you're a great resource now in our back door for hopefully a yeah. while. So you think you maybe come back? Absolutely, Brian. No problem. All right, Bobby Meacham. Uh, this has been Fanbase, a deep dive into the greatest rivalry in sports.